in this lecture we shall be discussing anderson's bridge this lecture has been conceived and prepared by dr saurabh jain ms richa dikshit and professor r s tare the main learning objectives behind preparing this lecture are to understand why do we need anderson's bridge to learn the circuit layout of this bridge the third important objective of this lecture is to understand the derivation of balance equations of this ac bridge the next objective of this lecture is to learn the drawing of phasor diagram of this bridge and the last objective is to enlist various advantages and disadvantages of anderson's bridge let us first establish the need of such a bridge when other bridges are already available there are three important ac bridges for the measurement of self inductance of a coil these are maxwell's inductance bridge maxwell's inductance capacitance bridge and hayes bridge let us first discuss the limitations of these three bridges for the measurement of self inductance of a coil first maxwell's inductance bridge requires very large standard variable resistance r2 while measuring a inductance of a low q coil therefore this bridge becomes very expensive if used for the measurement of inductance of a coil having low q this makes this bridge unsuitable for the measurement of inductance of low q coils maxwell's inductance capacitance bridge requires very large standard variable resistance r4 while measuring the self inductance of a low q coil this makes this bridge unsuitable for the measurement of inductance of a low q coil now let us consider the case of hayes bridge hayes bridge requires very large standard variable resistance r4 while measuring the inductance of a low q coil this reason again makes this bridge unsuitable for the measurement of inductance of a low q coil therefore there is a need of an ac bridge that can measure the self inductance of a coil having low quality factor say less than 10 anderson's bridge fulfills this gap this bridge is suitable for the measurement of inductance of low q coil anderson's bridge is a modified maxwell's inductance capacitance bridge in this bridge the balance is obtained by adjusting two standard variable resistances and a standard fixed capacitance now we will consider the circuit layout of anderson's bridge figure 1 shows the complete anderson's bridge we will discuss the individual components of this bridge this bridge consists of arm 1 having a known inductance l1 in series with its equivalent resistance that is lower case r1 besides this an external standard resistance upper case r1 is also connected in series with a known inductance arm 2 having a standard non inductive resistance r2 arm 3 is a standard non inductive resistance r3 arm 4 is a bit complicated a standard non inductive resistance r4 
is connected between vertices as shown in the figure. This resistance R4 is shunted with a series combination of standard variable resistance lowercase r and a capacitor C as shown. The junction of capacitor C and a variable resistance that is lowercase r is used to connect detector DT. Now let us name the vertices of this bridge. The junction of arm 1 and arm 2 is designated as point A or vertex A of Anderson's bridge. The junction of arm 1 and arm 3 is point B. The junction of resistance R2, R4 and variable resistance R is point D. The junction of arm 3, resistance R4 and capacitor C is point C. The junction of capacitor C, resistance R and detector DT is point F. Now let us name the arm currents. The current flowing in arm 1 is I1. The current flowing in arm 2 is I2. The current flowing in arm 3 is I3. The current flowing in resistance R4 is IR4. Now the current flowing through RC path is IC. Detector DT is connected between vertex B and junction of resistance R and capacitor C. A sinusoidal source with RMS voltage E is connected between vertices A and C. Now we will designate RMS voltages appearing across different arms and components. RMS voltage E1 represents the phasor voltage appearing across arm 1. RMS value E2 represents the phasor voltage appearing across resistance R2. E3 represents the phasor voltage appearing across arm 3. Now move to the shunt path for the resistance R4. The phasor representing voltage across standard variable resistance R is ER. Let us consider the voltage across capacitor C. The phasor representing the voltage across capacitor is EC. In the next attempt, now we will derive the balance equations for this bridge. Under the balance condition, the current passing through the detector DT is zero. This leads to arm 1 current I1 equal to arm 3 current I3 and arm 2 current I2 is equal to the phasor sum of current IC passing through path RC and IR4 the current passing through R4. For ensuring zero current through detector DT, the potential of point B and potential of point F must be same. This requires potential across R3 that is E3 should be equal to potential difference across capacitor C that is EC. Mathematically speaks I1 equal to I3 and I2 is equal to IC plus IR4. For Equating E3 and EC, we can write I1 into R3 is equal to IC into 1 upon J omega C. Equation 1 can be solved for IC, that is IC is equal to I1 into J omega C into R3. Arm 1 voltage E1 is equal to arm 2 voltage E2 plus 
the voltage drop across resistance R, that is E R. Mathematically speaks, I1 into R1 plus lowercase r1 plus j omega l1 is equal to i2 into r2 plus ic into r. Getting the value of ic from equation 2 and substituting this value in equation 3, we get i1 into r1 plus lowercase r1 plus j omega l1 is equal to i2 r2 plus i1 j omega c into lowercase r into r3. Simplifying equation 4 further, the terms associated with current i1 are put on the left hand side of the equation and the terms associated with current i2 are put on the right hand side of the equation. Mathematically speaking, i1 into r1 plus lowercase r1 plus j omega l1 minus j omega c r3 into lowercase r is equal to i2 into r2. Now, equating the sum of voltages across r and c with voltage across r4, we get ic multiplied by lowercase r plus 1 upon j omega c which is equal to I2 minus IC multiplied by R4. Rearrange equation 6 such that terms associated with IC are on the left hand side while terms associated with I2 are on the right hand side of the equation. That is IC into lowercase r plus 1 upon J omega C plus R4 equal to I2 into R4. Substituting the value of IC from equation 2 into equation 7, we get I1 into J omega C into R3 into lowercase r plus R4 plus 1 upon J omega C equal to I2 into R4. On dividing equation 5 by equation 8, we get R1 plus lowercase r1 plus j omega l1 minus j omega c r3 into r divided by j omega c r3 into lowercase r plus r4 plus 1 upon j omega c which is equal to r2 upon r4. After cross multiplying the equation, we get r1 into r4 plus lowercase r1 into r4 plus j omega l1 r4 minus j omega c r3 r4 into lowercase r equal to j omega c r2 r3 multiplied by r plus r4 plus r2 into r3. After rearranging equation 10 such that real and imaginary part are clearly separated from both the side. We get R1 R4 plus J omega L1 R4 minus C R3 R4 into R equal to J omega C R2 R3 multiplied by R1 plus R4 plus R2 R3 minus R1 R4. Now, Equating the real part of the equation 7, we get R1 R4 equal to R2 R3 minus R1 R4. Solving equation 12 for unknown R1, we get R1 equal to R3 upon R4 into R2 minus R1. Similarly, equating the imaginary part of the equation 11, we get L1 R4 minus C R3 R4 lowercase r equal to C R2 R3 multiplied by R plus R4. Simplifying equation 14, we get L1 R4 minus C R3 R4 into R 
इक्वल टू सी आर टू आर थ्री लोअर केस आर प्लस सी आर टू आर थ्री आर फोर आफ्टर सिंप्लीफाइंग इक्वेशन फिफ्टीन वी गेट एल वन आर फोर इक्वल टू सी आर टू आर थ्री आर प्लस सी आर टू आर थ्री आर फोर प्लस सी आर थ्री आर फोर लोअर केस आर और एल वन आर फोर इक्वल टू सी आर थ्री मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर टू आर प्लस आर टू आर फोर प्लस आर फोर आर और एल वन आर फोर इक्वल टू सी आर थ्री मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर इंटू आर टू प्लस आर फोर प्लस आर टू आर फोर सॉल्विंग इक्वेशन एटीन फॉर अ नोन इंडक्टेंस एल वन वी गेट एल वन इक्वल टू सी मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर थ्री अपॉन आर फोर मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर इंटू आर टू प्लस आर फोर प्लस आर टू इंटू आर फोर रीराइटिंग इक्वेशन नाइनटीन एंड इक्वेशन थर्टीन फॉर अ नॉन इंडक्टेंस एंड इट्स अ नॉन रेजिस्टेंस वी गेट एल वन इक्वल टू सी आर थ्री अपॉन आर फोर मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर इंटू आर टू प्लस आर फोर प्लस आर टू आर फोर एंड आर वन इक्वल टू आर थ्री अपॉन आर फोर मल्टीप्लाइड बाय आर टू माइनस लोअर केस आर वन दीज टू इक्वेशंस आर इंडिपेंडेंट ऑफ आर एंड आर वन दिस मीन्स दैट इफ these two elements are kept as standard variable elements the bridge offers high convergence now we are going to discuss the phasor diagram of the andersen's bridge since supply voltage is independent it would be convenient to take excitation voltage e as the reference phasor since the excitation source e is independent of all other parameters thus we take excitation e as reference phasor in the next step we will try drawing phasor for current i1 let us estimate the approximate phase for current i1 the path adopted by i1 is through l1 lower case r1 r1 and r3 that is the path is inductive in nature this means I1 will lag behind E by some angle. We will draw a phasor for I1 lagging behind E by some angle. Now we will try drawing different phasors representing voltages across different components along the path current I1. Current I1 passing through inductance L1 will produce a voltage drop I1 J omega L1. Ling I one by ninety degrees. Current I one passing through coil resistance lower case R one will produce a voltage drop I one R one in phase with I one. This is shown in the diagram by violet color phasor. Current I one passing through external resistance R one will produce a voltage drop I one R one should be in phase with I one. This has been shown in diagram which is parallel to I1. Consider the voltage drop across resistance R3. The voltage drop I1 R3 across R3 will be in phase with I1. In the phasor diagram, this voltage drop has been represented by phasor I1 R3 which is parallel to I1. Let us consider an important issue. The tip of the phasor sum of I1 g omega l1 i1 into lower case r1 i1 into r1 and i1 into r3 should be equal to excitation e this phasor sum must terminate at point c this can be achieved in a very simple way by drawing a line parallel to i1 and passing through c now from point a draw a line perpendicular to i1 and terminating into 
line drawing parallel I1. This phasor should represent voltage drop I1 J omega L1. Now from the tip of I1 into J omega L1, draw a line representing phasor voltage drop I1 into lowercase r1 parallel to I1. This phasor represents voltage drop across equivalent resistance of coil. Now we will draw a phasor which represents the voltage drop across external resistance R1. From the tip of the phasor I1 into J omega L1 plus I1 into lowercase r1, draw a phasor having length equal to I1 R1. This should be parallel to I1 phasor. The tip of the phasor representing I1 into J omega L1 plus I1 into lowercase r1 plus I1 into R1 is point B. The phasor VAB represents voltage across arm 1 that is E1. Current I1 passing through R3 produces a voltage drop I1 into R3 that is E3. This should be in phase with I1. Therefore, from point B, draw a line parallel to I1 having a length equal to I1 into R3. The phasor sum I1 into J omega L1, I1 into lowercase r1, I1 into r1 and I1 into r3 should represent voltage VAC that is excitation E. This means that the tip of the phasor I1 into r3 must terminate into point C. Now Look into nature of path adopted by I2. Current I2 passes through R2 and parallel combination of R4 and lowercase r plus c. This means this path is capacitive in nature and I2 leads E. Further, IC passing through 1 upon j omega c creates a voltage drop equal to and in phase with E3. The tip of phasor representing voltage across capacitor ends in C and begins from F. Thus points B and F overlap. Current IC that produces this voltage drop must lead this voltage by 90 degrees. Current IC flowing through resistance lowercase r produces a voltage drop ic into lowercase r in phase with current ic. The phasor ic into lowercase r should be drawn in such a way that the tip of phasor is in the point f and it starts from point d. The sum of voltages vdf and vfc is voltage vdc. Current IR4 passing through R4 produces a voltage drop VDC starting from point D and ending in point C. Current IR4 that produces this voltage drop should be in same phase parallel to VDC. Redraw phasor IC from origin. Phasor sum of currents IC and IR4 is phasor current I2. Further, I2 passing through R2 produces a voltage drop I2 R2 beginning from A and ending in D. Phase of I2 should be such that I2 flowing through R2 produces a voltage drop VAD. Hence, I2 must be along AD. This dictates phase of I2 along E2 that is VAD. This completes drawing of phasor diagram of Anderson's bridge. Finally, let us list the advantages and disadvantages of Anderson's bridge. Let's begin with advantages. The first advantage of Anderson bridge is the balance equation are independent of lower case R and upper case R1. Thus, if these two elements are taken as standard variable elements, the bridge offers 
fast convergence. The second advantage is the standard variable resistors are low in cost. Therefore, this bridge is economic. A fixed capacitor can be used making this bridge further economical. This bridge can be used to determine capacitance in terms of known inductance. The balance equations do not have frequency term omega. Therefore, very stable and nearly sinusoidal excitation is not required. This again makes this bridge more economical. Now, let's talk about disadvantages of Anderson's bridge. First disadvantage is this bridge is more complex as compared with Maxwell's bridge. It has more parts and complex in construction. As there is one additional junction, therefore difficult to shield. Therefore, this bridge is not suitable for high frequency applications.